chatted. We got a little bit carried away, but we chatted about the holy city. Enjoy. I feel the happy history on our shoulders. All the of our our school history, our song, this part of the history of our country, all work on and fish and liquidity. One child, one teacher, one book, and one pen can change the world. Simon Seabed Montefiore, imagine my happiness when you emailed me the other day saying, let's talk Jerusalem. I mean, I couldn't believe it. So here we are back in your lovely uh, office. And I mean, you, are, you, you, wrote the, you wrote the biography of Jerusalem, right? I wrote the biography of Jerusalem. And, you know, my aim was to write a book that hadn't really written, been written before. Of course, there are millions of books about Jerusalem. But what's unusual, unusual about this is it, it is a neutral history of everything, you know, from the Canaanites to Obama and Trump and the present day. You're going to have to write a chapter. You're going to have to write an epilogue now. I'm going to have to write the, the epilogue of, 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 the, of the American recognition of, um, of, of Jerusalem as capital of Israel, which, of course, um, has just happened. And that's, what, that's, why we're, that's why we're talking. Yeah, so I suppose let's start. Let's go all the way back. We t- people, it's a sort of axiomatic. Everyone sort of assumes that Jerusalem's always been at the heart of things, uh, centre center of three important religions, etc. But let's, get, let's go, I mean, was it even before the great monotheistic religions was it an important place? No. I mean, the strange thing about Jerusalem is, like, how has this sort of small mountainous town on the blistered, um, boiling hot, waterless mountains and, and deserts of, of Judea, how has this become, you know, the capital of, the, the capital of two peoples, three religions, um, and, a, and the most famous city on earth? And how, how has that happened? And the fact is, it's to do with holiness. You know, it's become the holy city. But it wasn't always thus. It probably started as a sort of Canaanite mountaintop um, shrine, like millions of others. Um, what made it um, significant throughout its history has been political decisions by leaders, often leaders not even in Jerusalem. But obviously the first to make, to make that decision was David, by placing the capital there, um, his son Solomon um, building the temple there. And um, that made it that made it politically the capital of the Jewish people, which was then which then divided into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And okay, so let's quick. Why did they do that? Is it it's quite a useful defensive position? Is it strategically well placed? It's strategically well placed in the sense that it's on a mountain. It's on mountains. It's on Mount Moriah, um, and um, and and of course it's a classic place for an ancient you know an ancient temple. Um, as well, and of course, it, you know, the, the, the old city, the, the, it is it is very fortifiable, and that's and that. But it's miles away from the the main sort of trading route. I mean, for example, when Alexander the Great marched down, he just marched straight past to Egypt. He didn't, you know, because you march down the coast is where the main trade route, and, and it's it's far inland, so it's not a natural pace for a capital. But what's made it special um, was first of all this decision of David's. Some people say um, is a proof that David existed. That's one of the things we discuss in the book. Um, if you're a believer, you believe that David existed. If you uh, believe in, in archaeological rationalism, as we do as historians, um, then you then you you you, you, you know um, you you use the Bible, of course, as 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 part of the proof. But archaeology seems to suggest that David did exist. Um, that there was a city there, a small one. And what period are we talking? 1000 BC. 1000 BC. 1000 BC. And, you know, there's the Tel Dan um, steel which, which mentions David. And we know for a fact that about 40 or 50 years after the, the, the death of King Solomon, um, that, um, that an, an, Egyptian, um, an Egyptian pharaoh is hooting outside. Yeah. An Egyptian pharaoh, Sheshonk, actually extorted vast amounts of gold from the temple in Jerusalem. So we know that the temple actually did exist. The Jewish temple did exist, you know, within 50 or so years of the, the possibly um, the semi-historical, semi-mythical um, kingdom of, of David and Solomon. And then, of course, it was the, then it was, of course, was the capital of, of Judah, the Jewish kingdom of Judah, ruled by the David family, the Davidian family. Um, until it was destroyed in 586 by, by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And it was this destruction. The strange thing about Jerusalem is that destruction has constantly been key in its crea- creation as the great holy city. And it was this destruction in 586 that meant the Jews went into exile and they started to write down the stories of Jerusalem, which became the Torah, the Bible, 
the books of David, whatever you want to call it. And that book, um, the Bible, the Old Testament, um, was the making of, of Jerusalem because that ultimately translated into Greek, um, used as the basis for Christianity, used as the basis for Islam, um, providing um, a, a, an authentic narrative of holiness, a, a heritage of holiness for those for the second of, and third of the Abrahamic religions. That made, that, that made the Bible the universal book and it made Jerusalem the universal city. It's thanks to that book, the fact that the Jews wrote it down, they told that story and they never gave up hope of returning to Jerusalem. Um, it's that that's made Jerusalem the holy city um, of history. And when did they manage to return? Well, they returned quite soon because they were exiled to Babylon. But within about 50 years, um, Cyrus the Great of Persia had um, conquered the Babylonian Empire and inherited Jerusalem. And he introduced a new, uh, he was a very interesting character, Cyrus, and his dynasty, um, Cyrus the Great, Darius the Great, um, they introduced an idea of a world empire, but where religions could, could, would be tolerated, local religions would be tolerated, providing they recognized the great king as total ruler, supreme ruler. So they let the Jews return, rebuild the temple, and that was the second temple. So that lasted f until the conquest of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great tolerated the Jewish religion as well. But one of, the, one of his Hellenic um, successors, um, in, in the kingdom of his uh, of the Seleucid kingdom, which sort of was one of the successor kingdoms of Alexander the Great, um, Alexander the Great's Macedonian Empire, one of them tried to crush the you know tried to ban and crush the Jewish religion there. That led to a huge revolt, the, Macca the Maccabees, um, in about hundred in about one hundred sixty BC, and that that led to an independent Jewish state again, which. Um, was called the Hasmonean Kingdom or the Maccabean Kingdom. And that lasted 100 years, ending with the Roman hegemony. And when then we're in Roman times, and Herod the Great. So, so what, uh, at what point did people, what, when, uh, when Cyrus conquered the Babylonian mm. Empire, were the Jews quite distinctive by that story? Everyone, like, These guys are pretty crazy. They've, they've held it, they're monotheistic, they've held on to their... I mean, because there's lots of little, lots of religions competing all over the Near East and East, East right. Central Europe and all that. So, but what, at what stage did people start to realise that the Jews were, were quite distinct? Well, then, I mean, that, you're absolutely right. It was around then. I mean, there was an enormous amount of syncretism, which is like, you know, sort of borrow other people's religion, merging of gods and, you know, as, you know, as we know best with the Roman, for example, with the Roman and Greek ones, there's a lot of sort of fusion between... Um, you know Venus and Aphrodite, you know the you know the, the, the Greek and the Roman gods and so on, but um, but the Jews were, were already stood out, and by the time that um, in 160 BC, for example, when the Seleucid king um, Antiochus tried to crush and ban the Jewish religion altogether, by then it was pretty clear that the Jews were a very odd and stubborn bunch because they still stuck to this monotheistic religion, um, which was totally out of the sort of spirit of the times. And I guess that's been part of the Jewish sort of heritage throughout history has been this kind of almost stubborn, um, stubborn belief in, in, in the Jewish religion and loyalty to it. And it's, and it's then given Jerusalem that special yes. tint because even those of us that aren't Jewish or aren't religious think, oh, it must be, there must be something going on there because yes. that's a profound attachment to this place. Well, the interesting thing is, I mean, I mean the, a lot of the argument now about Israel and Palestine um, I mean, the, the, I think the background to it is, is to understand that both sides um, are to shamefully, you know, t denying the narrative of the other. Um, the, pa the Palestinians officially are trying to say there was never a Jewish, there was never a Jewish ki uh, kingdom there. There was never a King David. There was never a, a temple on the site of the Temple Mount, the sacred Esplanade, um, or, you know, where, where the Dome of the Rock stands today. And at the same time, um, the sort of Jewish right. Um, the you know the Likud um, sub part of Israeli politics is constantly arguing that you know the Jews have been there for three thousand years. There's never been a Palestinian state. There's never you know the whole thing is is a sort of invention of history. And both have got to sort of both have got to recognise the narrative of the other. Um, and and both are, it's both shameful that that both are sort of are plugging those lines because because the archaeologists and historians of both sides know perfectly well that yes there was. a there was a Jewish state. There were several Jewish states. There was a Jewish capital in Jerusalem. There was a Jewish. There were two Jewish temples. Three, really, if you include Herod the Great's fantastic temple, which Jesus was the one that Jesus knew. Um, so, our, our mission as historians, Dan, you know, the reason why it's worth having this conversation is just 
for people to understand that, yes, the, the Jews have been there for 3,000 years, the, the Muslims have been there for 1,500 years, the Christians have been there for 2,000 years. People only have to live in a city for 50 years to, for it to be their home. So there's, it's not in doubt that both these peoples and both these religions have fantastically authentic, long um, and, and fascinating histories. And, we, and the only way they can make peace um, is literally to recognise each other's narratives. They have to recognise Yerushalayim, we have to recognise our Quds, and that's what my book, Jerusalem the Biography, is really about. And that's why it's worth telling the whole story. Let's, this is brilliant. Let's get, you've got, we got to Herod, we got to the Romans arriving. Yes. So the Romans, you talk about King Herod, was he a sort of client king? Was it direct imperial rule or did they sort of allow local elites to go on? You're, you're absolutely right. He's a client king. He's one of the most fascinating characters. He was the sort of Stalin and Henry VIII of the Bible. Crikey. And he um, is someone who married ten women, um, had many children, killed three of them himself, married one of the Maccabean Jewish princess, the beautiful Mariamne, who, who he then had to have strangled. I say had to have, because he didn't have to have. He insisted on having a strangle for disloyalty, and then kind of was in love with her and never got over that. Um, he then, um, he became one of the richest men in the Roman Empire. Great, great friends with all the Roman rulers, a sort of almost like, and, and the Herod family became a sort of, almost like sort of, um, a sort of a junior royal family to the, to the royal Julio-Claudian dynasty that, that lasted from sort of Caesar and Augustus to, um, to, to Nero. Um, for example, Nero was brought up with one of the Herods, Caligula was brought up with one of the Herods and so on. So they became a sort of, they became a sort of client, junior royal family almost. And Herod the Great was the founder of it. He was incredibly good looking, strapping, intelligent, but flawed, brutal, monstrous, but his great genius was, one, to create um, what is basically the, the old city of Jerusalem as it stands today with the sacred, esp huge sacred esplanade where the, where the temple stood and where now the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque stand. And he built the giant wall that is the holiest site for the Jews, the last bit of his temple standing. He designed the whole of, sort of Jerusalem as it stands today. So we show that's the Wailing Wall, as it's called. That's called the Wailing Wall. And, and it's also... actually a massive supporting, almost yes. foundational structure to where the old temple is. Yeah, right? and, it has, and it has stones in it that are literally 200 tons. So no one quite knows how the hell they transported this, but he did. And it's a beautiful piece of wall. And you're right, it's a supporting wall. But it gives you an idea of how extraordinary um, Herod the Great's temple was. It was the most amazing sort of temple in the world. I mean, even the, even the shrines in Rome um, were not great, you know, were, were, were only, you know, the, the, built by the Roman emperors themselves were, were not comparable to it. And, it, you know, it was incomparable. People said that when you came over the hill and you saw it, it was like seeing a, a mountain covered in gold or snow, because the white ashlar stones are so beautiful. And, um, and so he, that's, that's encouraged by the Romans, that's fine, he's yeah. kind of king, it's harmless for these yeah. Jews to be he rules for, He rules for an incredibly long time, yeah. um, Herod. Um, in the end, he kills three of his own sons, um, he has his wife strangled, and he builds this incredible thing, which, this incredible temple, which is the temple that, um, that Jesus walked in, and that Jesus was both, um, you know, Jesus, much of Jesus' life, as a typical Jewish boy, took, took place there. You know, his circumcision, um, probably his bar, some sort of bar mitzvah, and he continually returned there for the Passover festivals, and including, of course, you know, his last visit, the famous last visit um, to, to Jerusalem at Passover time, at Easter time, as it became. Um, by then, um, Jerusalem was ruled directly by a Roman procurator, Pilate. And, um, but, but the Herod kings, there were five generations of Herods who ruled great parts of what is today Israel, Lebanon, Jordan, and um, one of them was you know, one of them was the one you know Herod Antipas who tried or refused to try Jesus. Another one, um, and, and also who beheaded um, who beheaded John the Baptist, of course. Um, another one was Herod Agrippa, who was the great friend of Caligula. So they were always sort of they, they're a very interesting family because they kind of existed in parallel to Tiberius and Caligula and Nero. But the Romans so misruled Jerusalem that under Nero, there was a huge Jewish revolt. And that led to the destruction of, of Jerusalem, the temple, because when it was reconquered by Titus and his father Vespasian, they 
push down the, the temple. Um, huge piles of these rocks can still be seen, these stones can still be seen. They massacred everybody. Um, they burnt the temple down, uh, which was because the temple was, was, it wasn't just a building, it was a huge complex filled with sort of um, uh, parchments and beautiful silk curtains and cedar wood and so on. So it all went up like a hell of, you know, like, like a hell of an inferno. And um, Jews were banned. And there was then another Jewish revolt against Hadrian when Hadrian decided to, in about one, between 129, well, the 130s basically, about 132 he, AD, he decided to, um, to change the name of Jerusalem um, to build a, 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 a Roman temple on the site of the, on the, site of the, te the, the Jewish temple. And that caused a huge revolt by Simon Bar Kokhba, and, um, who I'm named after. Oh. You know, Simon, son of the star. And Shimon Bar Kokhba, and he, that, that failed totally and led to even more destruction. Hundreds of it's thousands of Jews were killed. Campaign, Genocidal yeah. campaign. Genocidal I campaign. Mean, because they actually did destroy, they managed to destroy a Roman legion, which as you know well, um, as a military historian, was a kind of like, that was the, about the worst thing that could happen in the Roman Empire. It gets you in trouble. It gets you in trouble. So they then brought massive forces down, and then they decided to change the name of Jerusalem to Aelia Capitolina, um, to make it into a typical Roman, Greek, Grecian, Greek, Hellenistic Roman town, and, um, and to change the name of Judah, Judea, to a name that, that, that would, was especially calculated to upset the, the last Jews who were there, which was Philist, you know, Palestine, based on Philist, the Philistines, the name comes from the Philistines, the sort of biblical enemies of the Jews. So there began the sort of the many centuries of sort of Jewish exile, really. Yeah, that was never again would the Jews have a state or even a sort of client state until well, the 20th well, century. Well, funny no. enough, weirdly, twice they did. Okay. Because under, um, of course, the, 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 the Constantine the Great adopted Christianity um, and um, as a state religion, um, one emperor, one empire, one religion, and he sent the most successful archaeologist to, um, to Jerusalem to find the site of the, the Holy Sepulchre, the Holy Tomb. Yeah, and, wasn't and his, his mum was successful. And it was his mum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So his mum, Empress Helena, was basically the most successful. Oh, I see. As a, as a slight sort of joke. But I mean, she was the most successful archaeologist because you know, she went to find this. She found it all. Of course she, she did. Found, she even found, you know, she found the nails. Um, that, had, that had been used on the cross, she found everything, and she built the first church, the Holy Sepulchre, and converted sort of Jerusalem into a Christian yes, city. Yes, this was the beginning of a, the kind of Christianized. Is, right. is it right to say that before that, with sort of the direction that Christianity went with St. Paul, Christ, Christianity's sort of focus wasn't really Jerusalem, was it? it was well, it was, there, were two, there were two focuses. You're absolutely right. I mean, Paul was interested in, his fascinating character, was Paul was interested in converting non Jews to Christianity. But actually, until 70 AD, the reason why 70 AD is so important is because until that date, there were the, 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 the Christians were a Jewish sect, basically, still worshipping in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and run by relations of, 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 um, of Jesus, first of all his brother, then his cousin. So until 70, and then when 70 happened and the empire fell, they could, say, they could see God had withdrawn his blessing from the Jewish faith. And Christianity separated, yeah. and Christianity separated it from the mother faith and became an independent okay, religion. As after the cataclysm of the destruction That's of the right. temple. So no wonder the Jews think the Christians are kind of splitters and yeah. yeah so they okay. But 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 also, I mean, so that was the end of the connection. Oh. And so, of course, um, Christianity, because each successive prophet, each successive faith, each successive revelation has to recognize, has to explain the centuries that went before it, because all holiness is about. Um, heritage about ancient, about time, about about um, what's gone before. So each each prophet has to sort of recognise that there was holiness before it, which they've inherited and and commandeered, as it were. So so that's what happens. So that's why you know the Old Testament is the Old Testament. The New Testament builds on it. And of course, Jesus was very interested as a Jew, practicing Jew. He was very interested in. In, 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 in fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament, just as Muhammad was then interested in fulfilling the prophecies of both the Old and New Testament. So Constantine the Great in the fourth, fourth century converts, Jerusalem now becomes one of the showpiece Christian, Roman Christian cities. And of course Jews are still worshipping pitifully around the walls of what was the temple, which include the Western Wall, the Eastern Wall, the Southern Wall, 
and they would pray there whenever they were allowed. The, the, the Temple Mount itself was a wasteland, and Jews were allowed on there once a year to be sort of mocked by the Byzantines and the Romans as kind of pitiful people, uh, and almost as proof that God had withdrawn his blessing from the Jews to give it to the Christians. And so the Jews never, never ceased revering, craving, loving Jerusalem. Um, this went on till Julian the Apostate for a second, m much later, in, in about 362, um, he, wanted to con he wanted to change the, 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 the Roman Empire back to paganism. And as such, he was very tolerant of, of other religions, including the Jews. So for about a year or two, oh. he was planning to rebuild the Jewish temple and he gave the Jews Jerusalem back or the Temple Mount back. So that's one weird exception. And then in about 614, um, the Persians conquered Jerusalem, yes. conquered the whole Middle East, in fact. And they gave it for two or three years to the Jews again. So that, those are the two kind of periods that no one knows about, which, which where the Jews again had Jerusalem. But um, that didn't work out. Heraclius, Heraclius reconquered the great Heraclius, legend. who, who yeah. was a sort of Dan Snow kind of <laughs> swashbuckling yeah. hero. A real podcast I, entrepreneur. A real podcast. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Um, I think, imagine, imagine <laughs> one of your, you know, your, 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 yourself a Heraclean character. Oh, gosh. Um, so, so, um, he got it back for a short while, and then, of course, the Muslims um, burst out of the Arabian Peninsula, um, and they they revered um, Jerusalem. First of all, Muhammad had had them worship towards Jerusalem, not towards Mecca, for a short period before the Jews re rejected Islam. And then um, the first cal Caliph Omar had taken Jerusalem, and one of the reasons why they were so keen to take Jerusalem in, in about 638 was that they believed very much in all the, the prophecy, the Jewish prophecies. They, they revered Jesus, David as prophets, and they believed that the end days, the apocalypse, would happen soon in Jerusalem. And it's one of the reasons they immediately started to pray on the Temple Mount. Um, they built a mosque there immediately um, under Muawiyah, the, one of the early caliphs. And then um, Abdul Malik in 691 built what was meant to be was designed in many ways as an Islamic version of the Jewish temple and built on the foundation stone of the Jewish temple, the rock. So a real feeling that the sort of each successive religion, you know, commandeering, borrowing, um, that not just the stones, but actually the stories of the, of, the, of the previous religions. And the more, one of the strange things about Jerusalem and holiness is, holiness is infectious. It only takes one, um, one religion to find a site um, religious and holy, for the other to do so. Religious, religion and, and, and religiosity and holiness are infectious, um, they're, com they're competitive, and you see that constantly in Jerusalem right up to today. Bit lovely way of putting it. Um, so then we've got uh, un unbroken centuries of Islamic rule, albeit different kinds of Islamic rule. Oh, actually, no, you haven't. You've got, what am I talking about? You've got um, Europe, you've got the Franks, you've got the Crusades. The Crusades. You've got yeah. the Crusades, so 1099. Um, you, get, you, get, you get the Crusades arriving. And the interesting thing about that is, you know, we think of the, 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 the Christian world as completely broken up into sort of warring barons and, you know, um, prince, principalities. And that's basically what you have in the Islamic world too. It's kind of broken, all the sort of great caliphates are broken up. And in the sort of, by the 11th century, you have kind of all these kind of rival warlords. And that's why, of course, a tiny army of 12,000 Franks is able to actually conquer basically the whole Middle East, this whole Lebanon, Jordan, Israel. And was um, Jerusalem the stated aim of the first group? It, 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 it was the get, stated aim right. of the, and of course, you know, the strange thing about Jerusalem is that Jerusalem exists in the mind as well. I mean, there were many kind of, every, every church in the Middle, in Middle Ages had a Jerusalem chamber. Um, Henry IV died in the Jerusalem chamber, for example, in, in, um, in Westminster Abbey. But um, everyone, so they all believed in this kind of idea of Jerusalem. In fact, Jerusalem was this pretty small, Islamic town with, 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 with a whole lot of Arabs and Jews living in it in 1099 when this kind of army arrived, this tiny kind of army of knights arrived in sweating, the Middle East, sweating, sweating in, yeah, in July, and they take the city and they kill every single person in it, all the Muslims and all the Jews. And it's supposed to be 100,000, as many as 100,000 people killed, but it's probably kind of 20,000, but it's still an astonishing massacre. And for that period, no Muslims and no Jews are allowed to live in it. But the Jews, of course, 
um, continued to pray around the you know around the temple walls as they had before, as they'd always as they always would. And of course, the Muslims were horrified by what the Christians were doing because they believed that everything that they found there was something to do with David and Solomon. So they believed that the, te- the Dome of the Rock, that magnificent dome that's still there today, of course, they believed that that was Solomon's palace. So they lived well, in it for a bit. Thank goodness. I, they, well, yeah, they, that was well, they'd have destroyed goodness, it. They, they might have destroyed they it. Yeah, I was going to ask why they didn't destroy yeah, it. Yeah, they believed that these all these sites were... Um, you know, were um, and they gave it to the Templars at one point, the, t- the Temple Mount. So, and, and of course, they rebuilt much of Jerusalem too. Queen Melisorn particularly built, rebuilt the 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 the, the, um, the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as it is today. Anyway, so that it was retaken in 1187 by Saladin, amazing character, fascinating, complex character, probably Kurdish, came from Iraq, conquered first of all, you know, first of all Egypt, then Syria and Syria and Iraq, and then finally. In 1187, got Jerusalem back. Amazing moment, and you know many of the great fam, the great Palestinian families of today, like the Hal Al Haldis, the the Nasebas and others, um, the Jani's, all start really from from that date. And you know the Nasebas are still um, opening the you know uh, opening the keys, um, have the keys to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as a sort of compromise in order to stop the Christians arguing among themselves. And that was given to them by Saladin, almost certainly. And Saladin, so Saladin brought back really the sort of Palestinians of today. There, of course, there had been families that had lived there since the, since the Islamic conquest in, six, in 638. Um, so that, that was really the beginning of kind of modern, modern history. And the, the Saladin family rules for, for, you know, his brother rules after him, Saladin, as the, as the Crusaders called him. And they ruled for a while, and then of course it was taken by the Mamluks, by the um, by the Ottomans. The Ottomans are interesting; they conquered the whole Middle East. Um, and Suleiman the Magnificent is the one who says, "Okay, I don't want the Jews um, praying around all of the, the Temple Mount. I'm going to give them a, a bit of wall." The which is they, and it was he that assigned them the wall. Oh, okay. um, which Some is interesting. Solomon's fingerprints are all over the modern world, aren't they? It's They're amazing. amazing. He's an That's amazing story. character. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, ruled for something like 60 years. Um, incredibly kind of soldier. Uh, fascinating l- lover as well, of course, of Roxolana. You know, his, his, he marries this kind of Russian a slave girl who, who then is the mother of the next, um, is, of the next sultan, of Padisha, as they call the emperor. And, and, you know, he also built the walls around because, you know, it's important to understand when one looks at Jerusalem is that Jerusalem is frequently ignored by everybody and, and almost forgotten um, by everyone except a few desperate Jews praying there. Um, uh, and, and the Muslims themselves are often very negligent of it. So the kind of CNN headline of like, you know, um, Jerusalem, holy to three, you know, holy to three face is really pretty modern. Because if you look at, for example, between um, about 1229 and the, and the 16th century, when Salad, when Solomon the Magnificent is the is the builder of the walls of old, the old city walls of Jerusalem, so they just date from Henry VIII. Those to <laughs> those walls, they're very recent. And well, I stroll on the feeling I'm connecting with yeah. in a Bronze Age sort of. That's, yeah. that's very well, you know, the ones around the temple, the ones in the south part of of, of the old city of Jerusalem, those are the original, and you know, obviously the Herod, the Herod Wall that we're talking about, and the walls around. The southern, the southern walls of it are very ancient, and they really do come from the Maccabees, from Herod the Great, maybe even older, you know, and definitely from definitely were, helped hold the, hold the temple, the, the second temple. But but the rest of the walls are all Solomon the Magnificent. They're, they're Tudor. They're, they're no older than the Tudors. And before then, for three hundred years, Jerusalem had just been left half abandoned, half empty, and um, with no walls at all. So it's you know under, under Muslim under very chaotic Muslim rule. So so that was one period when actually suddenly it ceased after the excitement of the Crusades for a few hundred years it ceased to be important. Um, so Suleiman the Magnificent was promoting himself as you know as a sort of Caesar as a sort of Caesar um, you know caliph um, and and sort of ruler of all religions as a sort of world world emperor and so he kind of embellished Istanbul, he also embellished um, uh, Jerusalem and he gave it walls, he kind, of, he, he kind of restored the Dome of the Rock which had, was falling apart by then and the Al-Aqsa Mosque and he, he was, so he was one of the creators, he never actually went there but he's one of the creators of the Jerusalem we know today 
But again, after his ex excitement of all his interest and the money he spent on it, I mean, he spent the entire income of, you know, the tax income of Egypt on embellishing Jerusalem. It's a very expensive project. And he put the tile, beautiful tiles that we see today on the Dome of the Rock, a Suleiman's. But then again, after about, a, up for the next three or three or hundred years, the Ottomans completely neglected Jerusalem, which began to fall apart, became to, began to empty. So by the time you get to the early 19th century, um, Jerusalem is ruled by various kind of irresponsible, shambolic Ottoman um, warlords, pashas. Um, the city is literally half empty. There's prickly pine forests within the old city of Jerusalem and nothing there. There is about 2,000 people living in Jerusalem, just about keeping the, you know, the, it's a, so it's like a monumental village, really. So that's a period when the Christians were ignoring it. Um, a few holy, really religious Jews lived there and went on pilgrimages there. Of course, some Muslims went on pilgrimages there, but the Muslims themselves had also really neglected it. That's right. So there would have been a much more dynamic Jewish community in Baghdad, for example, yes. than, than in Jerusalem. Oh yeah, there was a huge Jewish community yes. in Baghdad, all across North Africa, in Istanbul, in Salonika. Um, and then, of course, in the early 19th century, everything starts to change because um, uh, suddenly um, uh, there's this kind of Victorian, um, heroic, muscular, evangelical Christianity starts to take a huge interest in the idea that um, a return of the Jews would would lead ultimately to the Second Coming, which is also believed by American evangelicals today. And at the same time, people like my ancestor Moses Montefiore started to go there and started to sort of buy, um, you know, buy land. Um, and help the very poor Jewish community which was there. And Jews, and Jews start to move there, but also Christians suddenly start to take a huge interest in Jerusalem. And so you get, in the late 19th century, Christians are interfering very much in the Ottoman Empire, which is falling apart. And the Russians, the British, the Austrians, everyone starts to build in the old city of Jerusalem and build these huge shrines, um, churches. The Kaiser builds a huge church there. Um, and suddenly Jerusalem is being built into this kind of new holy city, um, fueled by, partly by Christian bibliolatry, which is a great word, which means like um, worshipping the Bible and looking at the Bible. And also people like Montefiore, the Montefiores and the Rothschilds, the big Jewish families in the West, um, suddenly start buying land and helping, helping the poor Jews there. And at the same time, the Russian Tsars are persecuting their six million Jews in the Russian Empire with pogroms so that Jews start to immigrate to Jerusalem, which they've always longed to do, they were never able to do, and suddenly they're allowed to go. And the Ottomans in. are too shambolic to stop them? Or they're too or shambolic to stop them. Threat? No, they're too shambolic to stop them. So you have an interesting situation that by the sort of 18, by, by about 1880, there is a Jewish majority in Jerusalem. I mean, the Jerusalem population is, tight, is pretty small, um, the, but you actually have probably a, a Jewish majority only in Jerusalem, not in the whole of Palestine. The whole of Palestine, there's a huge majority of, um, of Palestinian Muslim Arabs, mainly Muslim, some of them Christian, some of them Greek Orthodox. But, and, and so, it, first of all, there, was, there seems no threat from Jewish immigration. Um, and for the Jews, it's an amazing moment because for hundreds of years, they, they, they've longed to return to Jerusalem, and now they can, and so they do. The point about Zionism is, it, it's not true to say that Zionism is a kind of colonial, imperial invention of the 1890s. I mean, that was simply the organization, a political organization of Zionism started then, but actually there'd always been Zionism since 70 AD, and two people had always wanted to return there, and had tried to return there, and many times, you know. Um, so there's very in, it, it's a very interesting moment in the 1890s when they suddenly, Jews start to immigrate there, and of course, that ultimately leads to the Balfour Declaration, of, of, of 1917. 100, of 100 years ago. And 100 years, 100 years ago. ago, last week, the um, British captured Jerusalem. That's for the right. First time a Christian army, if you like, had done yeah. so for 100 years. Um, I've got a spasm of worry because I've looked, we've done half an hour, and we haven't even got to the 20th century yet. Well, maybe we should, maybe no, we no, shouldn't do, the, we shouldn't well, do too much of the well, 20th yeah, century. Yeah, we won't do too much, but the, the, the British, uh, the British um, promised Palestine to several different groups mm. uh, and um, but I mean, the, but the, really, the issue of Jerusalem being the capital of Israel is is, is probably from forty eight sixty seven, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, so well, talk to me about. Yeah. Well, there's two points to make here because we're running out of time. But one is 
The Balfour Declaration is just an interesting point because 100 years ago today should really be called the Lloyd George Declaration. What, your great grandfather? That's right. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, Churchill, Lloyd George, um, Churchill, Lloyd George, and Balfour were the three who really kind of were the, were the three Zionists in the cabinet, opposed by people like Curzon and the, and the Jewish Edwin Montagu, mm. who was Secretary of State for India. Um, obviously, the, you know, the, the, the whole point about it was that the French had already given a sort of Balfour Declaration a, a much, with a much stronger endorsement of Jewish return there. So the British weren't, it wasn't completely absurd that the British alone were doing this crazy thing. But it is true that um, one is that the Jewish, a Jewish claim to a sort of, to, 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 to a very, to a religious heritage in, 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 in the Holy Land was, of course, is of course totally historic. Um, what made the Balfour Declaration happen was that in 1917 the British were desperate to win the war and they promised all sorts of things to, to, to they promised all sorts of things to the Arabs and to the Jews, which they never promised to either. Um, you know, had it not been 1917, the Western Front bleeding like it, like it, like it was, and they were desperate for allies against the Ottomans. So that's why it happened. Um, it was careful to, to state that they, you know, that it was a Jewish homeland, not a state, and that there would be the, the, the Arab, indigenous Arab populations would be protected. And of course, by 1939, massive Jewish immigration and problems in ruling Palestine had made the British change their mind, and they reversed the Balfour Declaration completely in 1939 and said that enough. So, so you then get to the independence of Israel in 1947-48, promised by um, a UN resolution, and the Jerusalem is to be an international city. Um, what happened was that all the Arab states invaded and in fact, the Jordanians took half of it, and the state of Israel took the other half of it, and declared it their capital. No one else recognized it. The, the, it's, it's often forgotten, there's never been a Palestinian state. The Jordanians illegally took the West Bank and declared themselves King of Jerusalem. King Abdullah of Jordan declared himself King of Jerusalem, lovely title. And he's the only King of Jerusalem of recent times, which is rather fun. But um, in 67, the Israelis took the other half. And they united the city, and yeah, they, they, the Israelis marched into the so-called West Bank, conquered, annihilated the Jordanian army. Yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, although I must point out, because I got snapped, slapped on the wrist by the BBC mm. with pro enormous provocation from the Jordanians and other Arab armies. That's but, true. <laughs> they, you know, enormous provocation. I mean, the you know Nasser was actually about to sort of invade on all, on, on yes. three fronts with the Syrians and the Jordanians. So the Israelis were actually. I mean, now it's looked back as a sort of. You know, we've we've changed our view, but then the, the Israelis were regarded as the underdogs. underdogs. Yeah, yeah. And pre massive preemptive strike took out the Egyptian force on the ground. Amazing military yeah. victory, which no one really expected in six days. Took six Sinai day off the Egyptians. Took Sinai, the Golan Heights, and then advanced all the way up. So to the, yeah. after that, that led in it to eighty one, the declaration. I think it was eighty one of the of the of the you know of annexation of Jerusalem. So in effect, since sixty seven, um, Jerusalem has been for all intents and purposes, except international law, has been um, the, the capital of Israel. But I am very much against you know, Donald Trump declaring, um, declaring it the capital now unilaterally. I think all, you know, everything unilateral in the Middle East is a bad idea for a start. Secondly, though for all intents and purposes, you know, Israel is the, is the Israeli capital, um, and the parliament's in, in the parliament, in the Knesset yeah, yeah. is there. The prime minister's office is there, and frankly, you know, all foreign leaders go there. Um, it's a sort of it is it is one of these kind of um, preposterous international um, international sort of niceties, diplomatic niceties, rather like you know the, the strange American relationship with Taiwan and China, for example. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, it serves a purpose, which is to which is the fact that like the Israelis. Um, I think are, are, are following policies there of sort of of, of you know favouring Jewish Jewish areas over Palestinian areas and so so forth, um, which 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 aren't right. I mean, of course, it should be the capital of both both states, both peoples. And Donald Trump, by by suddenly declaring this um, in his slightly ignorant way. Is really um, is really giving away a, a point that should well, have been that should have been bargained for. That's the odd thing. He's the arch deal maker. And he just gave them a big chip for, in return for absolutely nothing. And, he un and of weird. course, he's undermining. I mean, there is there is a sort of peace process, which is a very interesting peace process, which involves the Saudis, um, which could you know lead to great things in the Middle East. 
Donald Trump's just gone and undermined his own, his own peace process, and he's so often you know, mutilating his own policies. So anyway, this should have been given as a confidence-giving measure in return for the Israelis giving something to the Palestinians. So I believe it's a big mistake. Amazing. Well, that was a rampage through the history of one of the world's most, uh, most famous and, and historically central cities. So I'm thinking, your book is Jerusalem, a biography. Jerusalem, the biography. Jerusalem, yeah. the biography. I've got to say, I, after, the, after the podcast I did with you the other day, your Red Sky at Dawn. Red Sky at Noon. Red Sky at Noon. Yeah, Red Sky at yeah. Noon. Let's yeah. get that right. After we, did, we talked about Red Sky at Noon, I went and read said book, and it's infuriatingly good. Oh, well, thank you. So, I'm I mean, so pleased. You're such a good novelist. Oh, it's thank you. so annoying. I mean, oh. you're a brilliant historian. I can swallow that, but I mean, it's just outrageous that you start writing brilliant novels. Well, thank, so you. thank you. Congratulations. Thank um, you. And what, remind me what's next, what's coming up? Well, I'm not sure, actually. I mean, we've got a lot of, we've got a, 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 a lot of movie you're stuff. You're doing movie stuff, aren't Well, you? a lot of movie stuff's happening. I mean, we've got... We've got um, people are trying to make drama series of 